नमस्कार अब वोम वेलकम टू वर्ल्ड न्यूज एंड इंडियन पर्सपेक्टिव ऑन ऑल इंडिया रेडियो दिस इज वेब हैव ज्योतना श्रीवास्तव एंड विद मी इज आदिति लूम्बा ब्रिंगिंग ग्लिम्सेस ऑफ द मेजर डेवलपमेंट्स ऑफ द डे फ्रॉम अक्रॉस द ग्लोब ओवर द नेक्स्ट हाफ एन आवर वी शैल ब्रिंग यू द लेटेस्ट फ्रॉम द वर्ल्ड ऑफ पॉलिटिक्स इकोनॉमी स्पोर्ट्स एंटरटेनमेंट एंड मोर द हेडलाइंस Prime Minister Narendra Modi underlines India's global leadership during the pandemic in his reply to the motion of thanks on the president's address in Rajya Sabha. China offers no rationale for its discriminatory policy disallowing the return of Indian students to its universities. India summons Ambassador of Republic of Korea over a controversial social media post by Hyundai Pakistan on Kashmir expresses strong displeasure. US approves 100 million dollar missile deal with Taiwan amidst tensions with China. India asserts sanctions regime should not become political instruments of a few powerful at the UN Security Council. US President Joe Biden warns of shutting down Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline if Russia invades Ukraine. Indian scientists develop novel technology to detect SARS-CoV-2 by fluorescence readout. and cricket india to take on west indies in second odi in ahmedabad on wednesday with the new omicron variant of corona virus causing concern we appeal to our listeners to be vigilant and to get fully vaccinated and help others including children between 15 and 18 years to get vaccinated please continue to follow these three simple steps to stay safe wear face mask maintain 2 gaz ki doori for social distancing and focus on hand and face hygiene so any covid related information and guidance contact national helpline numbers 0112397 and 1075 and now the news in detail prime minister narendra modi on tuesday replied to the motion of thanks on the president's address to parliament in the rajya sabha Speaking on the floor of the upper house Mr Modi called for collective partnership and collective ownership as India celebrates 100 years of independence Aajadi ke kalkhand mein desh ko disha dene ka anek star par prayas hue hain aur desh jab aajadi ke 100 saal manayega tab hame desh ko kahan le jana hai kin kin yojnaon ke sahare hum le ja sakte hain iske liye ye bahut hi mahatvapurn samay hai aur mujhe vishwas hai कि उससे जो संकल्प उभरेंगे उस संकल्प में सबकी सामूहिक भागीदारी होगी और उसके कारण जो 75 साल की गति थी उससे अनेक गुना गति के साथ हम देश को बहुत कुछ दे सकते हैं highlighting government initiatives during the covid-19 pandemic he said the country is marching towards administering 100% doses of covid vaccines to beneficiaries वैक्सीनेशन के संबंध में अभी प्रश्नकाल में हमारे आदरणीय मंत्री जी ने विस्तार से बात तो बताई कि जिस प्रकार से भारत वैक्सीनेशन बनाने में इनोवेशन में रिसर्च में और उसके इम्प्लीमेंटेशन में आज भी दुनिया में वैक्सीन के खिलाफ बहुत बड़े आंदोलन चल रहे हैं लेकिन वैक्सीन से मेरा लाभ हो या न लाभ हो लेकिन कम से कम वैक्सीन लगाऊंगा तो मेरे कारण किसी और का नुकसान नहीं होगा इस एक भावना ने एक करोड़ देशवासियों को वैक्सीन लेने के लिए प्रेरित किया ये भारत का मूलभूत चिंतन का प्रतिबिंब है जो विश्व के लोगों के सामने रखना हर हिंदुस्तानी का कर्तव्य है द प्राइम मिनिस्टर अंडरलाइन दैट ड्यूरिंग द पैंडेमिक इंडिया हैज प्लेड अ लीडरशिप रोल बीट एट द कॉप 26 और एट द जी ट्वेंटी और इन द एक्सपोर्ट ऑफ मेडिसिन टू मोर देन वन हंड्रेड एंड फिफ्टी कंट्रीज एंड द होल वर्ल्ड डिस्कसिंग दिस The Prime Minister said that fighting COVID-19 is also linked to a strong and cordial federal structure. There have been 23 meetings with respective chief ministers on the issue. Expressed grief over the boycott of the opposition parties who attend the all party meeting on the COVID-19 issue. After the Prime Minister's reply, the House adopted the motion of thanks to the President's address, negating all the amendments moved by the opposition members. earlier during the prime minister's reply the opposition parties including congress tmc rjd and others staged a walkout objecting to mr modi's comments 
China remains non-committal on the return of Indian students to their universities despite announcing that Beijing will facilitate the return of international students to China from Mongolia, Singapore and Pakistan to resume their classes a few days ago. China made these announcements after talks with the leaders from Mongolia, Singapore and Pakistan who came to Beijing to attend the Winter Olympics 2022. China did not give a timeline or a reason for disallowing Indian students from returning. Our Beijing correspondent reports that the Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Zhao Lijian in Beijing used his oft-repeated line that China is ready to coordinate efforts for the return of foreign students to resume their studies in China. China has closed its border since the beginning of the pandemic in 2020 but relaxed it last year in March for certain categories which did not include students. Around 23,000 Indian students have been waiting for their return to their universities for the last 2 years. The Indian embassy in Beijing has been continuously taking up the matter with Chinese authorities without a positive response. According to experts, China appears to be using the matter of return of international students as part of its negotiations with foreign governments rather than taking the decision on the basis of merit. This is evident from the recent announcements in the case of Mongolia, Singapore and similar announcements by China last year for Indonesia and Malaysia. The United States called on North Korea to defund its nuclear and ballistic missile programs and prioritize the need of its own people. The US ambassador to the United Nations, Linda Thomas Greenfield said, "The US calls on the Democratic People's Republic of Korea to demonstrate a commitment to the well-being of its own people by respecting human rights, defunding its unlawful weapons of mass destruction and ballistic missiles program and prioritizing the needs of its own vulnerable people North Korea has been under UN sanctions since 2006 over its nuclear and ballistic missile programs The US State Department has approved the sale of a defensive weapons package worth 100 million dollars to Taiwan The deal provides an update to the Patriot missile defense system and the field surveillance program for 5 years Taiwan's presidential office in a statement deeply appreciated the decision on Tuesday The statement added that the move underscores the US commitment to the Taiwan Relations Act and six assurances. The deal comes amid tension between China and the US over China's aggressive stance towards Taiwan. Last year, China had sent a record 150 military jets into Taiwan's air defense zone in a public show of force. US President Joe Biden on multiple occasions asserted rock-solid support of the US to Taiwan. The US has for years maintained a policy of strategic ambiguity under which it provides key military support to Taiwan but does not explicitly promise to come to the island's defense in the event of a Chinese attack. China, however, maintains that it is committed to bring Taiwan under its control by force if necessary. Taiwan's presidential office also asserted that Taiwan will continue to deepen cooperation with like-minded partners across the region to ensure peaceful and prosperous development in the Indo-Pacific. US President Joe Biden said that the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline would be halted if Russia invades Ukraine. This comes in the backdrop of Russia amassing close to 100,000 troops near the Ukraine border. Mr. Biden has said that the United States and Germany are working in lockstep to deter Russian aggression in Europe as he met with German Chancellor Olaf Scholz at the White House on Monday. Amid growing tensions in Eastern Europe, Mr. Scholz held in-person talks with Mr. Biden for the first time since coming to power in Germany late last year. Nord Stream 2 is an ambitious project having 750 miles of gas pipeline connecting Russia and Germany. The Baltic Sea pipeline bypasses Ukraine and is seen as depriving Kyiv of lucrative transit fees. The pipeline has been completed but has not yet been certified by Germany's energy regulator. Even though Germany has delayed the approval of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, it has refused to cancel the project. EU officials fear any move against Nord Stream 2 would trigger retaliation from Moscow, which provides for a major part of their gas demands. Meanwhile, Russian President Vladimir Putin held talks with French President Emmanuel Macron in the Kremlin on Monday. According to reports in a joint news conference after the talks, Putin said that the two would talk again once Macron had traveled to Kyiv to meet Ukraine's leadership. 
India summoned the ambassador of the Republic of Korea to express the strong displeasure of the government of India in a social media post by Hyundai Pakistan. The post termed unacceptable by India regarding the so-called Kashmir Solidarity Day made by the South Korean company Hyundai from its Pakistan headquarters invited the ire of New Delhi. External Affairs Ministry spokesperson Mr. Rindambakji said India's ambassador in Seoul contacted the Hyundai headquarters and sought an explanation. The offending post had been removed subsequently. The ambassador of the Republic of Korea was told that the matter concerned India's territorial integrity on which there could be no compromise. Mr. Bakhti said that the government expected the company to take appropriate action to properly address these issues. Foreign Minister of Republic of Korea, Mr. Chang Yi Yong, called External Affairs Minister Tuesday morning, and the Foreign Minister also conveyed that they regretted the offence caused to the people and government of India by the social media post. A statement was also issued by Hyundai Motors conveying its deep regret to the people of India and making it clear that it does not comment on the political or religious issues. The statement added that India welcomes investments by foreign companies in various sectors but expects such companies or their affiliates will refrain from false and misleading comments on matters of sovereignty and territorial integrity. In the northeastern state of Arunachal Pradesh, the bodies of seven army personnel were found who were struck by an avalanche in a high-altitude area of Kameng sector on Sunday. The Indian Army on Tuesday said the search and rescue operations have been concluded. It added, unfortunately, despite the best efforts of everyone involved, all seven have been confirmed dead. The area, located at an altitude of 14,500 feet, had been witnessing inclement weather with heavy snowfall for the past few days. External Affairs Minister Dr. Jay Shankar expressed grief at the tragedy. In a tweet, the minister said that the nation is deeply grateful for the service and commitment of those who guard our frontiers and risk their lives every day. He also extended condolences to the bereaved families. A team of Indian scientists has developed a new technology platform for the fluorometric detection of pathogens such as viruses by measurement of fluorescent light emitted. The potential of the new technology has been demonstrated for the detection of SARS-CoV-2, a report. Viruses are a major global threat to human health and the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic caused by SARS-CoV-2 continues to inflict catastrophic effects on all aspects of our lives. The unprecedented transmission rate of RNA virus has necessitated the rapid and accurate diagnosis to facilitate contact tracing and to provide timely treatment. Scientists from Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research along with scientists from Indian Institute of Science have demonstrated a molecular detection platform which can also be used to detect other DNA or RNA pathogens such as HIV, influenza, HCV, Zika, Ebola, bacteria and other mutating or evolving pathogens. The novel method can overcome the challenges in existing techniques of eliminating false positive detection results. The work has been published recently in the journal ACS Census and the team has also filed a patent for the novel technology. Abhishek Mukhopadhyay for World News AIR. India has asserted that the sanctions regime should not worsen the suffering of the populations at the receiving end. Speaking at the UN Security Council open debate hosted by Council President Russia on the general issues relating to sanctions, Mr. Tirumurti said there have been examples of terrorist groups making a mockery of the sanction regimes, including that of 1267 Al-Qaeda Sanctions Committee. Let us now listen to his excerpt from Ambassador Tirumurti's address at the Security Council. I thank the well, Russian delegation for organizing this debate on an important topic such as sanctions and its humanitarian and unintended consequences. I thank USG for political and peace building affairs, Rosemary DiCarlo, and USG humanitarian affairs, Martin Griffiths, for their briefings. I welcome the presence of countries under Rule 37. As per the UN Charter, maintenance of international peace and security is the primary responsibility of the Security Council, which has to act on behalf of all the UN member states in the discharge of its duties. Emanating from this responsibility, the Council imposes measures to maintain and restore international peace and security. These measures are required to be provisional in nature and not permanent. The Council has since been imposing non-military prohibitions and restrictions on member states. So far, the Council has established multiple sanctions regimes, including the ongoing 14. 
the sanctioned regimes have served well in our fight against terrorism, preventive diplomacy efforts, assisting member states in implementing peace agreements, and against proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. However, sanctions regime must not be an end in themselves. In their implementation, the sanctions regime must ensure that they have the intended impact and do not further exacerbate the suffering of the population at the receiving end. As such, it is necessary to keep these regimes under constant review so that they keep pace with the changing situation on the ground. The sanction measure should therefore be neutral in nature and should not become political instruments of the few powerful. Of late, the unintended consequences of sanction measures, including humanitarian consequences, are being increasingly emphasized by member states and other stakeholders. UN Secretary General has reiterated more than once that sanctions have exacerbated suffering in countries confronting armed conflict. The Office of Humanitarian Affairs has also referred to these concerns. The unprecedented impact of the COVID pandemic has also added to the miseries of the population in countries faced with sanctions. There is therefore an urgent need to credibly address these concerns to ease the sufferings of the people. In this regard, my delegation would like to flag the following six observations. One, the sanctions should always be used as an instrument of last resort after having exhausted all other options and in accordance with the provisions of UN Charter and should not be violative of the principles of international law. The Security Council should remain respectful of the regional approach adopted by countries and, in collaboration with regional organizations, address challenges related to peace and security before considering issuance of such sanctions. Two, there should be a clear end goal for such sanctions and they should not remain perpetually as mills around the necks of countries. As such, a clear timeline and criteria for its phased withdrawal be ideally spelt out from the inception stage itself. Three, all efforts should be made to reduce the negative impact of such measures on the population of the receiving state. In the context of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, it becomes all the more important. It is also necessary to ensure that legitimate trade and economic activities of the concerned state and its regional partners are not impacted adversely. It is therefore important for the Security Council to fully consult all key regional countries before considering any such measures because more often than not, the impact of sanctions is felt not just by the country but by its entire region. Four, regarding lifting of targeted measures such as arms embargo and asset trees, the Council needs prescribe realistic and achievable benchmarks to encourage member states to take steps in the right direction. We have seen that some of the benchmarks prescribed for conflict-ridden developing countries are even higher than what some developed countries have achieved. This is uncalled for. Five, it is imperative that sanctions do not impede legitimate humanitarian requirements. However, it is important to exercise due diligence while providing humanitarian carve-outs, especially in cases where terrorism finds safe havens. There have been examples of terrorist groups taking full advantage of humanitarian carve-outs, making a mockery of sanctions regimes, including that of the 1267 Sanctions Committee. There have also been several cases of terrorist groups in our neighborhood, including those listed by this council, rebranding themselves as humanitarian organizations to evade these sanctions. These terrorist organizations use the umbrella of the humanitarian space to raise funds, recruit fighters, and even use human shields. Under the garb of the humanitarian cover provided by such exemptions, these terrorist groups continue to expand their terror activities in the region and beyond. Due diligence, therefore, is an absolute must. Six, the sanctions committees continue to face significant challenges in overseeing the sanctions measures related to technical violations of the arms embargo, objections by humanitarian partners to the reporting requirement, questions about the working of the panel of experts, in some cases, non-cooperation by member states. The chairs of the sanctions committee need to play a more proactive role in addressing these challenges. For this, it is imperative that archaic and opaque working methods of subsidiary bodies of the Council need to be open, transparent and credible. In conclusion, Mr. President, it is our considered submission that sanctions regimes are simply a means to an end of the larger goal of maintaining international peace and security. They cannot become an end in themselves and therefore should not remain in perpetuity. We need to review the sanctions regime regularly and terminate them as soon as the objective is achieved. Towards that end, we need to set realistic and objective goals and ensure civilian are protected from unintended consequences of sanction measures. In this regard, we are ready to work constructively with all other members. The recommendations made by the informal working group on general issues of sanctions in 2006 could be a good starting point for a renewed deliberation in this council. I thank you, Mr. President. In today's hotspot session, we bring you a commentary on the increasing unrest in Balochistan.
द पाकिस्तान आर्मी इंटर सर्विसेज पब्लिक रिलेशन आई एस पी आर इन स्टेटमेंट लास्ट वीक से दट बलोच टेरिस अटेम्प्टेड टू अटैक पाकिस्तान सिक्योरिटी फोर्सेज कैम्प इन बलूचिस्तान पंजगूर एंड नुश्की इन टू सेपरेट अटैक्स दीज अटैक्स अ सेट टू हैव बीन सक्सेसफुली रिपल्स वाल इन्फ्लिक्टिंग हैवी कैजुअलिटीज टू टेरिस्ट बाई पाक फोर्सेज हाउ एवर द बलोच लिबरेशन आर्मी बी एल ए क्लेम दट इट इज मजीद ब्रिगेड हैड लॉन्च ऑपरेशन गंजल इन नुश्की एंड पंजगूर एंड कैप्चर द फ्रंटियर कोर कैम्प द ग्रुप ऑल्सो क्लेम दट ड्यूरिंग द सेवेंटी आर लॉन्ग कैप्चर ऑफ नुश्की फोर फिदाइन और स्वीसाइड अटैकर्स एट एम्ब्रेज मार्टिनम वाल द मैनेज टू किल अबाउट एटी पाकिस्तान सिक्योरिटी पर्सनल आफ्टर एन अदर सेवन फिदाइज कैरिड आउट अटैक्स एट द पंजगूर एफ सी कैम्प दीज अटैक्स एट द लेटेस्ट इन स्ट्रिंग ऑफ सच अटैक्स इन बालूचिस्तान ऑफ द लास्ट फ्यू वीक्स अकॉर्डिंग टू रिपोर्ट ऑन द नाइट ऑफ ट्वेंटी फिफ्थ ट्वेंटी सिक्स जनवरी द टेरिस एड कंडक्टेड अ फायर रेड इन कैच एंड वाल रिपल्सिंग दम वन टेरिस्ट एंड टेन सोल्जर्स वे किल्ड ऑन ट्वेंटी एथ जनवरी थ्री लेवीज फोर्स पर्सनल वे किल्ड एंड एट इंजर्ड इन टू ब्लास इन स्वी ऑन थर्टी एथ जनवरी सेवेंटीन पीपल इंक्लूडिंग टू पुलिस मैन वे इंजर्ड इन अ ग्रेनेड अटैक इन जफराबाद डिस्ट्रिक्ट सब्सिक्वेंटली ऑन फोर्थ फेब्रवरी थ्री बलोच मिलिटेंट्स वे किल्ड ड्रिंग अ सर्च ऑपरेशन इन कैच वाल सिक्स पीपल इंक्लूडिंग टू लेवीज पर्सनल वे इंजर्ड इन अ ग्रेनेड अटैक एट अ लेवीज चेक पोस्ट इन चमन द मजिद ब्रिगेड दट क्लेम द नुश्की अटैक एड ऑल्सो अटैक द पाकिस्तान स्टॉक एक्सचेंज इन कराची इन जून ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी दे ऑल्सो डेसिक्रेटेड द पार्क फ्लैग अटॉप द बिल्डिंग दिस ब्रिगेड वॉज फॉर्म इन टू थाउजेंड इलेवन एंड हैज बिन एक्टिव सिंस द अटैक्स बाई बलोच मिलिटेंट्स अब पिकड अप इन रिसेंट मंथ्स डिस्पाइट द रिटर्न ऑफ द तालिबान इन अफगानिस्तान इन ऑगस्ट ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी वन द बलोच मिलिटेंट्स अब इंक्रीजिंगली टारगेटेड The result does not seem to flag in the face of determined action by the security forces of Pakistan. At the political level in Pakistan, there have been several efforts to placate the Baloch people by providing various sops to them. However, attempts have also been made to divide and fragment them and weaken the movement. It seems that the Baloch sense of alienation has only grown in intensity over the years. The Baloch have an abiding sense of alienation in many grievances vis-a-vis -vis the Pakistani state ever since the partition of 1947. The Khan of Kalat, the king of Baloch people, wanted to stay in independent but was forced to sign the instrument of accession after a news report suggested that he was planning to join India in March 1948 since then Balochistan has witnessed five waves of insurgency during 1948-51 1958-1959 1962-63 1973 77 the current wave has been going on for almost two decades now the baloch lemons arise from the step motherly treatment meted out to them by the pakistani state balochistan is rich in minerals like natural gas gold aluminum copper lead zinc platinum uranium etc despite being a resource rich state balochistan scores lowest in most developmental parameters more than 58% of baloch lives below the poverty line over 80% of balochistan's districts are high deprivation areas compared to 50% in sindh and 29% in punjab only 2 out of 32 districts in the province are food secure it has the worst ratio for doctors in the country more than 70% of children between the age of 5 and 16 do not attend school the literacy rate is only 39% 62% of people do not have access to electricity. The province receives only 700 megawatts of electricity out of 2000 megawatts generated in Balochistan. The Baloch people also believe that the gains of China Pakistan Economic Corridor CPEC will never accrue to them even if Balochistan becomes the major attraction for Chinese investments. Added to this excessive force used by Pakistan to crush the insurgency by using helicopter gunships and in discriminate killing of Baloch youth has alienated the people further. The growing number of missing persons in Balochistan has attracted the attention of human rights organizations worldwide pakistan has rejected these allegations and tried to divert attention of the baloch people by laying the blame on others for the growing militancy in balochistan however these diversionary tactics have only worsened the situation in balochistan the baloch people and its diaspora are seeking international support for the grievances and independence from pakistan this is all india radio giving you the news For quick news updates round the clock follow us on our twitter handle at aia news alert India's Ministry of Culture will organize the first of its kind global summit on reimagining museums in India on the 15th and 16th of February. The summit is being organized under the aegis of Azadi ka Amrit Mahotsav, the flagship program to mark 75th anniversary of India's independence and celebrate the glorious history of its people, culture and achievements. The government said that the global summit will bring together leading luminaries, domain experts and practitioners in the field of museums. in development and management from india and around the world to discuss best practices and strategies 
In cricket, the second ODI of the three-match series between India and West Indies will be played on Wednesday at the Narendra Modi Stadium in Ahmedabad. Vice skipper KL Rahul and Mayank Agarwal have joined the Indian camp after missing the first ODI. Speedster Navdeep Saini is also back with the team after testing COVID negative. In the first ODI, India defeated West Indies by six wickets to take 1-0 lead in the series. And now a report from the business world. The Sensex climbed 187 points or 0.33% to settle at 57,809 while the Nifty rose 53 points or 0.31% to close at 17,267. In the global stock markets, Asian shares traded mixed amid US moves against 33 Chinese entities while investors were waiting for US inflation data that could influence how fast the Federal Reserve raises interest rates. Hong Kong's Hang Seng fell 1%, however China Shanghai Comp Opposite index climbed 0.7%. Singapore's Straits Times ended 1.1% up, while South Korea's Kospi and Japan's Nikkei 225 both ended marginally up by 0.1%. European share markets were also mixed in the intraday trade. Oil prices fell around 2%. The crude prices fell ahead of the resumption of indirect talks between the United States and Iran, which may revive a nuclear deal that could lead to the removal of sanctions on Iranian oil sales, increasing global supplies in the intraday. Trade Brent crude was trading around ninety dollars and eighty cents per barrel. Nishit Kumar for World News, All India Radio. Now let's take a look at the major developments around the world as reported in the foreign press. Let's take a look at what made the headlines in Nepal. Economic Times writes that a Nepalese government report has accused China of encroaching into Nepal along with two countries' shared border. The Annapurna Express writes that the Nepalese government decided to send a task force to Humla over possible Chinese encroachment. And now some news from Bangladesh. A probe has been ordered in the death of five Russian employees of the Rupur nuclear power plant in the last 11 days, reports Dhaka Tribune. Prothom Alu reports that the per capita income of Bangladesh has increased to 2,591 US dollars in the financial year 2021. AFP reported a Chinese city of 3.5 million near the border with Vietnam was on lockdown Monday after more than 70 coronavirus cases were discovered there over the past 3 days. Reuters reported China's use of a Uyghur athlete to carry the Olympic torch cannot be a distraction from the human rights abuses the genocide committed against the Uyghurs according to the White House spokesperson Jen Psaki. And turning to Afghanistan now Tolo News reports that Afghanistan Shiite religious scholars called on the Taliban to ensure social and public justice through negotiations. Hashte Sob reports that popular Hollywood actress Angelina Jolie shared the letter of an Afghan woman on her Instagram page calling the world to help Afghan women not to be forgotten. And now the headlines before we end. Prime Minister Narendra Modi underlines that India's global leadership during the pandemic in his reply to the motion of thanks on the president's address in Rajya Sabha. China offers no rationale for its discriminatory policy disallowing the return of Indian students to its universities. India summons ambassador of Republic of Korea over a controversial social media post by Hyundai Pakistan on Kashmir expresses strong displeasure. US approves 100 million dollar missile deal with Taiwan amidst tensions with China. India that sanctions regime should not become political instruments of a few powerful at the UN Security Council. US President Joe Biden warns of shutting down Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline if Russia invades Ukraine. Indian scientists develop novel technology to detect SARS-CoV-2 by fluorescence readout. And in cricket, India to take on West Indies in the second ODI in Ahmedabad on Wednesday. Now, before we end, let us listen to Mahatma Gandhi's favorite bhajan, Vaishnavajan, by artists from Kazakhstan.
With that, we end this bulletin. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow with the next edition of World News.